The outstanding English poet, Geoffrey Chaucer, renowned before Shakespeare, is considered the first finder of our English language. His Canterbury Tales ranks as one of the greatest public works in English literature. Renowned author, Chaucer also contributed importantly to the second half of the 14th century to the management of public affairs as a courtier, diplomat, and civil servant. In a career that spanned three successive kings, Chaucer was praised and trusted, but it is his avocation, the writing of poetry, for which he is remembered. Geoffrey Chaucer was born around 1342, likely in London. His family name derives from the French Chaucer, meaning shoemaker, though Chaucer's father was a wine merchant. Chaucer's first appearance in historic records is in 1357 as a member of the household of Elizabeth, Countess of Ulster, wife of Lionel, third son of King Edward III. Geoffrey's father presumably had been able to place him among a group of young men and women serving in that royal household, a customary arrangement whereby families who could provide their children with opportunity necessary for courtly education and connections to advance their careers especially since Chaucer reportedly had 16 siblings. This was going to excel him in society. Though this meant Chaucer had to leave his family and work as a page in servant to a knight, he was only 15 years old. By age 17, Chaucer was a member of King Edward III's army in France and was even captured during the, the unsuccessful siege of Reims. The king himself contributed to Chaucer's ransom to save him in order to return him to his majesty's service. Chaucer surfaced again in historic record on February 22, 1366, when the king of Navarre issued a certificate of safe conduct for Chaucer, three companions, and their servants to enter the country of Spain. This occasion is the first of a number of diplomatic missions to the continent of Europe over the succeeding 10 years. At the age of 25, Chaucer had moved from a household servant, a soldier, to that of a trusted diplomat. So much responsibility and activity in public matters appears to have left Chaucer little time for writing. However, the time traveling did expose Chaucer to the works of Dante, Petrarch, and Bocchiasso, which was later to have a profound influence upon his own writing. No information exists concerning Chaucer's early education, although doubtlessly he would have been fluent in French, as was the Middle English of the time. He also became competent in Latin and Italian. His writings show that he is closely familiar with many important books of his time. In 1366, Chaucer had married longtime friend Philippa Pan, a lady in waiting to the Queen of England, and continued his work for His Majesty as a diplomat. With Chaucer's career prospering and his first important poem, Book of the Duchess, becoming popular, Chaucer continued to connect himself with persons in high places. This first poem was more than 1,300 lines long probably written in late 1369 or early 1370. It is written for the funeral of Blanche, Duchess of Lancaster, wife of John the Gaunt, who died of plague in September 1369. John of Gaunt was Chaucer's best friend. Lord, but mine heart is maketh light, when I think on that sweetest right, a commonly one to see, and wish to God it might so he that she would hold me for her knight, my lady, fair and bright. When Rich II ascended the throne, Chaucer was appointed clerk of the king's work. His pay raise was more than 30 pounds a year and a pitcher of wine daily. He became responsible for construction at Westminster, the Tower of London, and several castles and manors, but times were still hard for Chaucer. It is during the same time that Chaucer was caught up in illegal scandal. The charges were dropped and Chaucer was found not guilty, but regardless, Chaucer's place in society greatly changed. He resigned or was removed, it is not clear, but Chaucer left the court and moved to Kent, after which his wife, Philippa, died due to poor health, 
leaving Chaucer with two sons and two daughters. Between the years of 1387 and 1400, Chaucer devoted much of his time writing his most famous work, Canterbury Tales. The humor of the work is sometimes very subtle, but it is often broad and outspoken when compared to other works written at the same time. Chaucer's original plan for the Canterbury Tales called for two tales each from over 20 pilgrims making a journey from Southwark, England, to the shrine of St. Thomas Becket of Canterbury, England. He later modified the plan to write only one tale for each pilgrim on the road to Canterbury, but he only finished 24 tales out of the 120 stories is believed he had been planning. Chaucer introduces each of these pilgrims as vivid, brief sketches, a lively mix of a variety of genres told by the travelers of all aspects of society. The tale survives in groups connected by prologues, or introductions, and epilogues, conclusions. But the proper arrangement of these groups is not altogether clear. At this time in medieval England, Literature was separated into very distinct styles, focused more on audience, the lower, middle, and upper classes, than its characters. Chaucer, however, moves freely between all of these styles, showing favoritism to none. He not only considers the reader of his work as his intended audience, but the other pilgrims within the story as well, creating a multi-layer rhetorical puzzle of ambiguities. Chaucer's work thus far surpasses the ability of any single medieval theory to uncover. Chaucer avoids targeting any specific audience or social class of reader, focusing instead on the characters of the story. The characters are written with a skill proportional to their social status and learning. Chaucer draws on his own unique background, knowledge, literary influences, and life experiences. The characters are all divided into three distinct classes. The classes begin with those who pray, the clergy, the highest of all of the classes in medieval England. Those who fight, the nobility, and those who work, the commoners and the peasantry. Chaucer also breathes new life into his female characters, giving them, for a first time, a voice as narrator. Until now, medieval literature only classified women as wives, virgins, or prostitutes. They were never given a primary role in a story. When Henry IV takes the throne, Chaucer hoped to find a new job under a new king. And while Chaucer's reputation for loyalty earned him a small pension, Chaucer went months without pay and was near penniless. Nevertheless, on the strength of his expectations, on the 4th of December, 1399, he released a tenement in the garden of St. Mary's Chapel at Westminster, and it was probably here that he died on the 25th of the following October. He was buried in Westminster Abbey, and his tomb became a nucleus of what is now known as Poet's Corner. It is unclear how he died, and some have even speculated that he may have been murdered. Little is known about this great man's end. Even with such unique and varied life, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales praises the poet as the greatest English poet of all time, and the first to truly show what the language was capable of becoming. His work has influenced all to come after him. The work of Shakespeare, Marlowe, Edgar Allan Poe, Charles Dickens, and even author J.K. Rowling credits Chaucer as a strong influence. A very modest plaque was placed at Geoffrey Chaucer's tomb when he died. However, 150 years later, in 1556, as a testament to his great poetic works. Poet Nicholas Burnham constructed a more magnificent tomb in honor of the father and finder of our English language. Today, Chaucer's tomb still stands and hundreds of visitors pay him homage each day. 
His works and his unconventional creativity in the 14th century credit him with not only founding the English language, but for capturing the voice of kings and commoners alike. <laughs>